Hey folks, I'm Dino Monoxilis. I'm Dom Liberati, and this is episode two of SVT Time. I am so honored to introduce you to the father of the SVT, Mr. Bill Hughes, we have on set doing? today. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. So how did you get started at Ampeg? When was it? How, how did it happen? Well, <clears throat> my sister was dating a guy in the Coast Guard, and he had an Ampeg guitar amp that he used to play and it developed some problems and uh, I uh, did a, rep a repair job on it. I lived in Rawway, New Jersey and Ampeg was in Linden, New Jersey. And it was like maybe five miles away. And I uh, went down there and purchased a brand new speaker and uh, I encountered Jess Oliver. That's how I got an internship at Ampeg. Okay. Huh. Started as an internship. How and old just were you then? Oh, I think I was 15 years no old. No kidding, huh? Wow. Yeah. And was Ampeg a, a household name at that time? Was it a, a big brand like it is today? or? No. They were just a, a local company that uh, built guitar amplifiers. And there was a uh, machine shop, and uh, there was a wood shop and they, they, where they made the, uh, parts for uh, fretted instruments. And uh, it was a very small company. And you said you started as an intern, so what was your job when you first got there? I swept up the floor in the stock room. I kept the place clean. I also was a uh, inspector at receiving inspection when new parts come in and go have to come up with tests for the parts and make sure they're, everything was correct. How long from intern to you know, amp designer, how long was that path? Six weeks because Jess wanted me to put the SB12 together. Wow. So that was my first project to get the SB12 running. I was like a technician working for Jess. Okay. And it was a very interesting project. So did most of your knowledge and, and engineering knowledge come from on-the-job training, working at Ampeg, or did you go to school Yeah, at some point? I went to school. I went to Penn State University. Okay. Uh, uh, I got a degree in chemical engineering. My father was an audiophile, so a lot of the knowledge was passed down from him. Uh, my grandfather ran the Hughes Phonograph Company, which was a company that made wind-up phonographs. It's been in our family all these years, this, this concept of building things like that. And you said uh, the SVT was a little bit of a secret project when you guys started? Yeah, uh, none of the development work for the SVT was ever shown to Everett Hull. I think we showed him the power amp once. I brought it in as a project from home saying, uh, look at this. And uh, he, he, he was interested in it and he thought it was impractical. The original SVT had uh, two 811A output tubes in it and it was 150 watts and it was an amplifier designed for driving uh, the recording head on a disc cutting lathe. Wow. And uh, so that was developed uh, in my basement at home. And uh, when Everett was uh, not in the picture anymore, uh, Roger Cox got me to develop it into a, a bass amp. So what was the mindset behind um, going from 150 watts in the power section to 300 watts and uh, was it just all about competing with guitar amps at the time? Was it? Well, the, the amplifier was not meant to be a musical instrument amplifier at the time. It was it was a, a, a built for a different purpose. Yeah. And uh, when we decided to build the SVT, uh, uh, we needed uh, a big power amp. Uh, the loudspeaker was not a vented baffle. It was a sealed box, which is a speaker that was typically less efficient. The speaker got so big because it had lots of cone displacement required to do the job. Obviously, it had lots of uh, cone displacement capability. And uh, Roger designed the speaker, and uh, it was designed as a uh, sealed baffle. A sealed baffle exits at a rate of 12 dB per octave. When it, when it re reaches the cutoff frequency, it, it exits at that rate. A vented baffle exits at 24 dB per octave. One that exits at 12 dB per octave and one that exits at 24, obviously you, you know which one's the winner's gonna be, so the, this is the sealed box. It's gonna have more deep low end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a, a good maneuver. Yeah. 
So that whole system, the SVT with the two A10 bottoms, that, that was an entire system all designed together. Oh yeah. And to, to work in conjunction with one another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I never understood the concept of uh, designing a bass amplifier with one guy's uh, electronics and another guy's speaker. I, I just said, it makes no sense. So why eight 10 inch speakers? I don't recall the deci decision why eight speakers and why 10 inch speakers, but it was thought that 10 inch speakers would have generally a good frequency response for bass amplifier application. And why was it eight? Uh, eight 10 inch speakers was considered the number of those speakers it would take to work reliably with that amplifier and not fail. Gotcha. Hmm. That was a big risk back then too because a lot of bass amplifiers employed either 15s or 18s. Was anybody really uh, like thinking of using 10 inch speakers for bass back then other than, other than Ampeg? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I remember the, uh, the amplifier of the, of the time that was the Rage was the, the Acoustic 360. Mm -hmm. yep. And that, what was that, a 18 inch driver? It was a folded 18 and the two amplifiers uh, side by side, uh, the Acoustic uh, 360 was not the winner. How cutting edge was the SVT at that time? It was quite different. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was one of a kind. A base amp that big, uh, done with tubes, I mean, I don't think I could have designed a 300 watt solid state amplifier at the time that I would have believed in to be reliable. Uh, that was uh, that was early technology. Was it well received uh, in the market when it first came out? Were people really, really excited about it, or did it take a while to catch on? No, it, it caught on in a hurry. Yeah. So it uh, it was very successful. There were problems with it. Uh, I mean, the transition from 6146s to 6550s. Uh, I came back from the, the East Coast Stones tour, and I thought to myself, we're in trouble because uh, we had uh, amplifiers going down. Uh, Keith Richards would use them uh, for lead guitar and he could play in a certain particular manner and he can get the three tubes on the, on the left to go cherry red in the plates and then he changed his picking style and he got the three tubes on the right to go cherry red <laughs> because of uh, how he stressed the, uh, the yeah. devices. Wow. We made the decision to go to 6550s, and that was a, a very wise decision. Uh, there's been all kinds of uh, talk about which one sounds better and which one sounds worse. Uh, I think they both sound equal. They use the same output transformer, so they're the same impedance at the plate. There's no reason why they should be different, but the 6146s just weren't as reliable. That, which you, you actually brought up a very good point that I've uh, just sparked a memory. You were on that on the Give Me Shelter tour when the Stones came over and they were basically beta testing those SVTs. That you, was the Get Your Yacht. Was it the Get? It was it the Get? Oh, okay. I thought it was. So I, and it was you and who else was on that tour that you were basically sent out to to field repair uh, these as they. Roger uh, was doing the West Coast. I was doing the East Coast. Uh, Richie Mandela was there. Uh, the Stones tour was about two weeks before I got married. And I didn't take my wife with me because it was frowned upon. My future father-in-law would have killed me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'd take my wife on a Rolling Stones tour. I don't think anybody either. would take their wife on a Rolling Stones tour. <laughs> Are you a big Stones fan? Now I am. Yeah. 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 <laughs> was it on that tour or was there another concert moment where you heard the SVT and had this moment of like, wow, that's my baby. Like, well, the first, the first, the first night, I said, yeah. "That's my baby," and yeah, you know, uh, I, I was shocked at uh, how loud the, the things were. I mean, it was uh, just a wall of amplifiers. We used to service them for the Stones, and uh, uh, Mick Jagger had his 30th birthday, and uh, there was a whole bunch of amplifiers sent back to us. I had to clean, get them cleaned up to get the pie out of the grill cloth. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me, Bill, what were some of the challenges in, in, in developing and building the SVT? Let's see. Uh, 
Working with voltages that high, yeah. uh, PC board layout was a problem. My boss at the time was uh, a guy named Murray Figlin, and he did the PCB layout. I remember there's some spacings on the traces that I thought were a little bit too tight. And sure enough, when I turned it on uh, the first time, we had a flashover that, uh, you know, it blew up. Obviously, that had to be fixed, and uh, the breakdown voltages were, were, were a big issue. On the early SVTs, uh, there was a notch in the chassis, in the seal of the chassis, right next to pin three on each output tube. That was to give the, that pin enough room so that it wouldn't flash over. Hmm. And I think the SVTs even today have that notch in the uh, yeah. seal. It's a thing we carried with us uh, for years. How does it feel now, 50 years later, and still knowing that the SVT is the industry standard for bass tone? I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm just amazed that the, the product uh, is still this, this viable at this point. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, you know, that's, the SVT changed the way, you know, recorded bass and live bass right. was heard. Right. You know, bass players owe a lot to this guy, yeah. just saying. <laughs> I did a lot of studio work uh, in the 60s and, you know, uh, mastering tapes and everything. And uh, I had a lot of interplay with various bass players who I won't identify, but I learned what the instruments should sound like. Mm -hmm. What specific Ampeg amps do you recall? I remember we were talking about this. Oh, I recall them all. I remember the SVT, I remember the uh, B15S. Yeah. Uh, I remember the VT40, uh, the V4, the V4, the yeah. V4B, uh, the VT22. Yeah, I mean, uh, you had your hands in all of those. Yes. Wow. So, what other projects outside of the music industry have you worked on? Well, when I left Ampeg, I uh, went back to school. While I was in, at uh, going to school, I I did uh, transmitter maintenance radio stations and television stations. And then I went out to California and I did a lot of work on semiconductor wafer and dye inspection equipment. So these were these were devices that were used in uh, IC factories to inspect IC masks and chips and all that. And then I went to work for uh, International Video Corporation and we did design of diagnostic medical imaging equipment. Uh, I designed videotape recorders for some years, television cameras. Where do you see the world of bass amplification going in the future? I see the world of bass amplification going to purposely design systems that will be lighter, outperform heavier bass amplifiers. I see that as the wave of the future. Matter of fact, I, I've written a uh, a dossier to myself about the bass amp of the future and I, I see the bass amp of the future being a hell of a good performer for five string bass. Mm, five yeah. string bass has been has n never been the spotlight of the bass amp designer. There's still still a lot of bass players that are using four strings but five strings and extended range instruments but it's it seems like your concept going all the way back to the SVT was and still is, instead of designing a head and cabinets separately, designing an entire system to work together. Yeah, designing the two systems as separate entities is stupid. It just, I mean, it, it, it shows a, a lack of definition of uh, how things should be done. Yeah. 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the SVT. And in honor of that, we came out with a with the Heritage 50th Anniversary SVT, which I know. is something we've never done before that Ampeg hasn't done, but it actually pays closest homage to the original SVTs of, of the late 60s and 70s. Are we doing a good job? <laughs> do, yeah, of course. <laughs> do, we, do we get your thumbs up at least? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Under Yamaha, I mean, this is going to be very well maintained now. I, I think it's a I think it's in good hands. Yeah. yeah. Well Bill, I can't thank you enough. We can't thank you enough for coming out here, making the journey to sit down with us for your contributions to the base world. Yeah. I know for certain 
as an SVT guy myself, my experience of, as a bass player would have been totally different had the SVT not existed. So you've made my life a lot easier as, as a working musician, so I want to thank you for that. Bass players all over the world owe this guy a debt of gratitude, and um, we're going to close it out with that. Yeah. I'm Dom Liberati. I'm Dino Minoxilis. This is Bill Hughes. Keep tuning in. This is episode two of SVT Time, and we'll be back. Thank you.